Shalom. Today we are continuing the series of comparing the five scrolls, Hamesh Megillot, with the five books of Torah. Today we are going to talk about the book of Ruth in comparison to the book of Leviticus. Not by word count or by chapter count, but maybe by book count, Leviticus is at the center and the heart of the Torah. Before we continue about this, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what is called equidistant letter spacing, and it is part of the Bible codes. The Bible codes probably go back to maybe the 13th and 14th century, where the rabbis began to investigate this, and uh, they became a little more to the forefront, uh, and maybe in the 50s, particularly Rabbi Weissmendel, who lived in the beginning part of the 20th century, did a lot of work with this, was published by his students after his death. But obviously, since the age of the computers, it's been a lot easier to investigate these things. And I'm sure you already know about this, and you can investigate it further elsewhere. Just to show you about a bit about Leviticus, this, what you're looking at, is the first few verses of Genesis. And if you start with that first letter, Tav, which is highlighted, and count 50 letters, you will come to the Vav, which is highlighted, and again 50 letters to the Resh, and again 50 letters to the He, and these letters spell Torah. What is interesting is that the book of Exodus is the same. If you start with the first Tav and count 50, count 50, it will also spell Torah. Uh, this is not true for Leviticus uh, or Numbers of Deuteronomy. However, in Numbers and Deuteronomy, if you start with the He and count 50 letters, it will come to a Resh and count 50. It will come to a Vav and finally come to a Tav. And so it seems like they spell Torah backwards. So you have Genesis and Exodus spelling Torah forwards and Numbers and Deuteronomy spelling Torah backwards, pointing toward Leviticus. In Leviticus, we see that if you start with the Yud and count eight, you come to He, and count eight, you come to Vav, and count eight, and you come to He, and you have Yud, He, Vav, He, the name of the creator of the universe. So it seems like we could say that the other books are pointing toward Leviticus, and Leviticus points towards the Creator. And in that sense, it is the center. Leviticus carries all the essential laws. The other books have a lot of narrative in them and telling stories of what happened to various people in different times. There's only, I think, two narrative stories in the book of Leviticus. The rest of it is Torah. Some people say law. The word Torah actually means teaching and instruction. How we should live as the people of God. And this, of course, is very relevant to Ruth because it gives her the entire framework for her coming in to join the people of God. Particularly, Leviticus 19 has a great deal of how the people should relate to one another. And her coming from a pagan culture, the Moabite culture, we can feel fairly sure that the people were not so nice to each other. Uh, they were uh, very even vicious in their child sacrifice. They are known for that. And we can imagine that the people were not so kind towards each other, and they did not have these humanitarian-based rules, which Yahweh God gave to his people so that they would be a shining example to the world. we we'll just read a few of these, beginning in chapter 19, verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, of course, you know that reaping and gleaning are integral to the story of Ruth. You shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am Yahweh your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another. 
You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. Continuing in verse 14. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. This last verse being something that Yeshua emphasized as being one of two of the most important commandments. We have to remember, because particularly in America, we have a strong foundation of Jewish and Christian-based morality in our country. We have to remember that this is due to the generations of people who have served Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of the universe. People who do not have a foundation of understanding who the one true God is will not have a moral foundation. There is a problem where we have slipped into a slumber of being a moral country without having a foundation of God. So we don't understand that this moral foundation comes from the laws from our God. We just generally think of ourselves as good people. But we must understand people who do not have that foundation in other parts of the world where their morality is founded on pagan idol worship, we see that they do not have a similarly moral civil society. The opportunity for Ruth to be accepted as a stranger into the Hebrew people is in Leviticus 19, 33 and 34. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, you shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt, I am Yahweh, your God. Again, the gleaning laws are repeated in Leviticus 23, 22. This is an interesting position. We'll talk about that in a minute. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am Yahweh, your God. So this was her opportunity to have sustenance for her and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Of course, we know the position of the kinsman redeemer uh, is central to the story of Ruth, beginning in Leviticus 25.25. 25. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. The word here for redeem is goel and used in the participle tense, it explains to us that this is the person also, not only the action, but the person who's doing the redeeming. Again, in Leviticus 25, 48, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him for the person who has sold himself into service. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Some people consider the marriage of Boaz to Ruth as a levirate marriage. This might be a bit uh, contestable. It does say in Leviticus that a man ought to not uh, marry his brother's wife, but this is in the case if the brother is still alive. Leviticus 20, 21. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, 
and they shall be childless. However, this is not in the case of if the brother has died without raising up offspring. You can see that the lever marriage goes back uh, into Genesis, that it was customary, from Genesis 38.8. And Judah said unto Onan, Go into thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. This is not the normal word for marry, but it is the word specifically for the marriage so that the brother can have an offspring. The dead brother will still have an offspring to his name. It's a different word than the usual word for marry here. The Leveret marriage is laid out more specifically in Deuteronomy 25, starting in verse 5. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name shall not be put out of Israel. But if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders, and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel, he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Continuing in verse 8, Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. So we see that this is the procedure that was accomplished later in the book of Ruth, although these things are from Deuteronomy. Moving to the actual story of Ruth, we see that they return to Israel in, at a crucial period in the calendar. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. The beginning of the barley harvest is a very specific holiday, which is mentioned in Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 10, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So this is in the midst of the week of Passover. This event happens. It's very interesting that the commandment is for when you come into the land. And here we see Ruth and Naomi coming into the land at that time. The word here, which is translated as first fruits, is not the normal word for first fruits. It actually means the first sheaf, or what we call the first omer. And this day begins the counting of the omer to the festival of Shavuot, to the festival of weeks, or Pentecost. This is the first fruit of the barley harvest, and this mentioned in Leviticus 23 is the only place where this festival is spoken of. The only other time we read about this festival is in the New Testament in several places. One of them is Mark 16 beginning in chapter 2. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulchre at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Yeshua of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. We see that it's the morning of the first day. This is after the Shabbat, just as the commandment to bring the offering is on the day after the Shabbat, the commandment in Leviticus concerning this. It's a kind of first fruits, but it's really the beginning of the Omer. 
So this is the point at which Naomi and Ruth come back to the land of Israel. They come back and Ruth takes advantage of the gleaning laws. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech, who, as you remember, was Naomi's husband. Her hap. She just ha it just happened that way, or not. In Ruth 2.14, there is a shadow picture of a covenant being made. And Boaz said unto her at mealtime, Come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and, she, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat and was sufficed and left. Uh, you can see more in this video about Ruth and this covenant. What does this mean? In Ruth 2.20, Naomi reveals, Woohoo, Boaz is one of these Goel. He's a near kinsman. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of Yahweh, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said to her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And we see that Ruth stays on, Till an appointed time in chapter 2 verse 23 so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law there is a reason why she must wait a certain amount of time according to traditional Jewish law that a widow must wait at least three months before she can remarry so that they can be sure of the paternity of any following children. So from the end, from the barley harvest, the beginning of the barley harvest, until the beginning of the wheat harvest is 50 days. This is the period that we were talking about, counting the Omer. And then she stays on past that into the wheat harvest. So it's interesting that we find in Leviticus, this gleaning law is repeated directly after the commandments about the festival of weeks, the festival which is the beginning of the wheat harvest. Leviticus 23, 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering to Yahweh. King James has always writes meat, even if it's any kind of food at all. This is clearly a grain offering. It's an offering of wheat. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals, and they shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven, and they are the first fruits unto Yahweh. Now here the first fruits is the word bikurim, which means specifically first fruits. The interesting thing, of course, about this festival is that the bread is baked with leaven. This is unheard of in any other offering. And so it points to something very specific. When we read about Pentecost in the New Testament, this is that day. This is the festival of weeks. And you can look at this other video and get a lot more about the comparison of the two festivals. Acts 2 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Why were they all in one place? What place they were, were they in? They were in Jerusalem because they were commanded to be there. It was one of the three pilgrimage holidays, and the men were required to be in Jerusalem. So it's not like everybody just suddenly showed up and said, Hey, uh, we think something's going to happen in the Spirit. Not at all. They were there as they were commanded. And then, as Yeshua promised, he sent the Spirit on that day. This is crucial to the growth of the congregation, of the family of Yahweh. Without the release of the Spirit, the apostles and early believers could not have realized that the Gentiles were to come in. We see the discussion that happens later. In Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas are discussing their evangelistic journeys and all the amazing things that have happened amongst the Gentiles. 
It was never in the mind of the Hebrew people that the Gentiles would be coming into the congregation of faith. After they hear the description of the events, this is the declaration of the council. After they had held their peace, Paul and Barnabas are finished talking about what they have seen on the road. James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. The prophecy from Amos. Without the Spirit having come on these men, it is doubtful that they would have understood what exactly they were witnessing. We should always remember that prophecy is not for prediction. Uh, in this day and age, it's a very popular for people to be counting up, oh, this is happening and that's happening. Yes, I think we can see that we are in the midst of certain times. But the main prophecy of the main purpose of prophecy is to say, oh, this is that which was spoken of by the prophets. It's a reminder on our way as we see what's going on to say, oh yes, this was written of and now we can see the fulfillment of it. The story of Ruth is the story of the Gentile bride and she marries into the line of Judah and her offspring are in the line of Messiah. These events are made possible by the laws that are given in Leviticus for accepting the stranger, for allowing her to glean, for the kinsman redeemer to buy back the land and to take with it uh, the property. In other words, Naomi's daughter-in-law to be married into the line. I think it's also important to realize that Ruth would have understood most of these things and the beauty of what she saw in her mother-in-law would be what drew her, what, what wooed her, that the God of Israel wooed her to leave her family and to come to a strange land and, and adopt a new people and adopt new gods because she could see the beauty of the things that we see expressed in the book of Leviticus, the kindness of human beings one to another, how people are to treat their God. Going back to the equidistant letter spacing, we find an interesting Bible code in the first verse of Ruth. If you come to that Yud and count five, you have a Shin, you count five, you have a Vav, and you count five, you have an Ayin. And this, of course, spells the name of Yeshua, the ultimate kinsman redeemer for all the people on the planet. I hope this has been somewhat edifying for you. Till next time, Tasimita Inayim al Hashemayim, keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.